This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. And I'm Raghu Marcus. With today's talk from Ramdas, or this week, and it's called uh, Living the Mystery. And it's a talk from October 1996. So, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, something like that. And uh, this talk, so uh, there's a lot in this talk from Ram Dass around suffering. And uh, one thing in particular stood out, and uh, that was when he talked about uh, that the cause of suffering has to do with the clinging of mind. Of course, this comes from Buddhist principles. And that the things you cling to are attractions or aversions. And the thing that I was clinging to was an inver- was an aversion of me as a human being. I was busy being holy. Uh, that is very much a uh, catch that we all get to, to go through, uh, especially when we are just finding our way on the path. And uh, my in my own experience of this, which was pretty strong uh, example, um, when I was in India with Neem Karoli Baba, with Maharaji and the, our whole crew that was over there, uh, we, of course, were relating with the path, you know, at uh, 10 million miles an hour, so to speak. I mean, we were fully engaged being around this incredible being and this incredible vibration. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that I got a glimpse and I'm not anywhere near anything on, on astral plane, remembering past lives or any of that stuff. But I thought that when I traveled through India, I felt so at home after a while. The thought of going back to the West was like, I just couldn't even imagine it. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I remember being on the river in Benares and on the Ganges and just absolutely luxuriating in it all. And I don't mean just, you know, the getting high part, the, all of it, you know, engaging with everything from uh, the sickness and disease and poverty and, um, uh, you know, so j- the whole ball of wax, just the whole seeping into my being, I just felt like, God, I've been here before, you know, I've walked along these banks and um so i started you know completely identifying with myself as a quote unquote sadak sadhu i remembered as far in my little fantasy world just being walking around free and just devoting myself completely to practice and to spiritual life, you know, no worldly affairs. So I just completely identified with myself in that way, as phony as it uh, as it was. Because in the midst of all of this, I met, and we were with Maharaji, and I met a woman, became very friendly with her, and to the point we were spending all of our spare time together, just chatting. And there were, really was no romantic thing in it uh, at the time whatsoever. And every time we go see Maharaji as a group and we end up sitting next to each other, he'd look at us and he'd go, Are, in Hindi, through a translator, are you friends? And we'd go, yeah, yeah, we're friends. Every day we'd come there. In, in Hindi, friends is dost. Doste, your friends? And every time he'd say it, we'd become even more friendly until we got to that ultra intimate friendly. That only happened after he said to her, have you slept together? And she went, what? Absolutely not. And of course, we did that night. So uh, suddenly my sadhu-ness took a bit of a hit. And... uh <laughs> 
it became clear and he finally just said, well, when are you getting married? So we went through this whole process with him and he in- eventually did marry us. And, um, uh, and off we went after, you know, being in India for, in my case, a year and a half, uh, off we went, uh, back to the West and where we did get married and so on. And, all of that time, I fought, I fought it even before he married us. I fought it. I was like, God, I can't be getting married. I'm a sadhu. I'm a holy person. Holy people don't get married. And he, you know, and Maharaji would, he supported this, this stuff because he would say marriage brings greed, lust, and attachment. It's difficult. As if we all don't know that now. And, uh, so I went to him one day and I said, well, you know, because he said, you're, you're going to get married, right? He would always ask questions. He wasn't like saying, go get married. It was just bringing up what the karmic inevitability was. And I, um, said to him one day after he said that, I said, well, why would anybody get married? You said it brings greed, lust, and attachment. Basically, I was saying to him, why are you doing this to me? And uh, so when I said that to him, you know, it, you said it, it brings you just this grief. He looked at me right in the eyes and said, it's your desire. So then I realized, okay, this is just, uh, he was just, uh, you know, watching the karma get for f- fulfilled. And he was just, you know, you know, just helping us speed it along. So, uh, that he did. Um, and I saw that I really, you know, had, uh, you know, tremendous karmic, uh, uh, connection with this, with this woman whose name is Parvati. We are now good friends, although, uh, we did get divorced after having a couple of kids. But the main point of this is that after we went back to the West and after I kept seeing, how I was pushing away and pushing away, relating on a human level. I was one, you know, I just had this, this really, um, uh, very simple idea of naive. That's the word naive idea about being on the path. And I had an attachment to this persona that I had created for myself in India. And, uh, you know, then it, it, so being married and living in the world and all that wasn't being holy. So this, this is a very, uh, gross example of what Ramdas is talking about because we have way, way more subtle, uh, areas in which we push off our humanity. So, and Ramdas says, so at the, po- at the point he realized this, he said, I turned my efforts around and I looked at life and realized I had to embrace my humanity into my being in order to be free. And that is such a a great, great lesson. It took me many, many, many years, many years, uh, getting down to the subtlest level of, of my attachments related to what my ideas were about, uh, quote unquote, uh, leading the holy life. So, I got battered around pretty good, and that's what happens. And and you realize you just have to embrace all of that. And what else does he talk about here? Let's see. Uh, immensity of... Uh, he looked at the immensity of suffering. Suffering was so vast. And he realized, or and we need to realize, not to hide from the incredible suffering that exists among our family and I don't, it, he's not meeting just personal family, but our human family. And we, we close off because the suffering is unbearable. And, and, uh, it's like, you know, watching the evening news and you see the suffering, which is, you know, just getting worse and worse and worse. And, and the things that we do to armor ourselves from this, this, this is, uh, but we're in this funny predicament that the suffering that exists in the universe is immense and that until you can be with that in some way or other inside your being and be open to it, you have no real freedom because you are so busy avoiding something and your ability to free anybody else 
is then quite limited. When you realize you want to relieve suffering, you realize that you have to come to become an instrument for the removal of that suffering. And that means you have to be free of suffering. And so the, this great, great story he tells uh, in this talk, um, and it's an incident where we were all together. And this is back in 1971 and with Maharaji, with Neem Karoli Baba and Ramdas, uh, became very agitated over the suffering that was going on at that time in Bangladesh. And I think everybody, you remember George Harrison did a whole, uh, you know, it was one of the first uh, organized concerts to support a cause. And he did that. Uh, um, that was from that time in Bangladesh. There's extreme starving, starvation and so on. So uh, Ramdas had a, a minivan and he wanted to go there and help in any way he could, even just as an ambulance. So he went to Maharaji and he explained what he wanted to do. Maharaji did not say anything, one do this, do that or anything. He just looked at him and he said, Ramdas, don't you see it's all perfect? And Ramdas said when he when he said that it was like like being screamed uh, like he had an obscenity screamed at him. It was just, you know, his whole body convulsed because, you know, how could you hear of children dying and with the same consciousness say, say it's all perfect? And, and Ramdas talks about, uh, how, how many years it took him to, to even have any understanding of this. And this is a major, major question that many people ask. How could there be this kind of, Suffering. How could there be any, any justice? And the process is realizing that you and I exist on more than one plane of consciousness simultaneously. And on one plane, suffering stinks. And in another plane, suffering is grace. And the question is, can you balance these two things in your consciousness? Because to the extent you can, you are then capable at looking at suffering and bearing the unbearable. Because who it was that found it unbearable has changed. And that is uh, a, supremely important to get even a glimpse of understanding how to have uh, that, that things are happening there on more than one plane of consciousness. And there, there is a way for this to exist. And this is not, you know, obviously this is not uh, from judgmental mind. And that's, and when that starts to change, when your vantage starts to change, then you can have the, the tiniest glimpse of, of the perfection of the universe. So, and, and none of this can be said glibly and only a being that is completely free, like Neem Karoli Baba could ever say such a thing. And only we who continue to practice and work on compassion and work on, on changing our vantage point from ego mind to, uh, to spiritual heart. Can we, we have any possibility of understanding this? So, um, we are awakening or being forced to awaken or the conditions are ripe for awakening. And that has to do with recognizing that you exist both as an actor, as a doer, as a body, as a personality, as a storyline. And then there's another part of us that's our awareness that is absolutely clear, present, ah, as he calls it. So, um, very, very important. Great talk here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to uh, play this in a minute. I do want to, and it's uh, what I said, it's, it's, uh, living, uh, in the mystery, um, which I love, you know, uh, it's, it's, how do you live with the mystery? The mystery, we don't know what happens when we die. That is a mystery. Um, how do you live with the not knowing, you know? And he talks about Leary, who was his fellow adventurer, and they played at the edge of the mystery. Moment by moment, life is the edge of the mystery. And the way in which we approach our death is critical to the experience we have of our life. So really great, great stuff here. Uh, I want to mention something else before I uh, play this talk, and that is that uh, all, you know, like, Going, me going into the media library and finding this talk, uh, is not an easy thing, unfortunately, because 
Everything has not been digitized. Everything has not had descriptions or keywords or metadata. And uh, it's not so easy to find. And certainly, uh, you know, and I have, I'm living with this, uh, you know, as the uh, director of the foundation. Uh, so we have a big project to digitize the media library, make it accessible for everyone to find, like, you know, just this kind of thing. How, you know, can we hear something about, you know, the balance in suffering of, of, of uh, dealing with uh, the pain that we are going through, the pain that our human family is going through? And how do we balance that with becoming who we are? These kinds of things need to be gone through. And there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hours. I don't know. We, we don't even know. Because we, uh, we have to, uh, hire the appropriate people who know how to deal with media libraries. And we have to get, uh, the right technology. I mean, we have, uh, the beginnings of a search engine on ramdas.org. If you go there, you can search, um, to find some of these topics. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's 20% of what we have. That's, that's the truth. And so we have a big uh, project to raise money, and we, we I'd love for everybody to help. Uh, please come to, uh, you can find a banner to link on ramdas.org, and it's, uh, we've hooked up with a, with another organization called Urgency Network. Dot com and uh and you get uh if you the big prize for uh uh joining and taking action there's all sorts of actions you can take to win uh, a chance to win a 3 day retreat with Ramdas in Maui all expenses paid from anywhere on the mainland i think you have to read the the fine writing, but if you're in Europe and uh, the Far East, I'm not so sure. I guess so. Uh, but uh, please come help us and uh, and join in uh, in this. This is a a really great cause, so that we can get this library straight uh, and available and digitized and um, and and get the proper uh, search engine, so make it searchable, so we can all find what we need to help us along the road a little bit in these very difficult time. So thank you for that. Thanks for supporting uh, this podcast. And uh, here is Ramdas uh, living in the mystery. Is that what it is? Living in the mystery, living the mystery on Ramdas here and now. I've got a wonderful confession to make. Um, a while back, I bought this shirt, which I like the color. And um makes me feel good. So the first time I put it on, I went to an Italian restaurant. And as I was eating my salad, because I have a belly now, so everything is more on a horizontal and a vertical, uh, a big glob of uh, oil and vinegar went onto the shirt. And I've washed it in everything. All those things that say they will didn't. So I still had this stain here. So each time I carry the shirt, because I like it, and I put it on, I said, no, I can't wear that, it's got a stain. So what I've done is I put my name tag over the stain. was introducing me, I thought about a situation a little while back, past year, or a year ago, when I was invited to do a benefit for a, um, a sort of a graduate school, um, kind of a humanist graduate school. So um, the people, the woman in charge called me and she said, what would you like to speak about? It was going to be a dinner benefit in San Francisco. What would you like to speak about? So I said, well, I said, I've just completed a book on aging, or I'm just completing a book on aging. Why don't I speak about that? She said, oh, no. She says, nobody's going to come to a dinner benefit to hear about aging. <laughs> okay. She says, what else could you speak about? I said, well, I work a lot with the dying. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was out of the question, so I said, well, I've done some books on compassion. I work a lot with suffering. <laughs> So she decided to title the lecture, uh, Mining the, Mining the Jewels? Mining the Riches of Life. Mining the Riches of Life. And I spoke about death, suffering, and aging, you see. (laughs) And one woman got up and she said, she was a little drunk, and she said, you seem very negative. <laughs> and I was having a great time, you see. So, <laughs> but now and then I do feel a little bit like a Charles Adams cartoon. You know the cartoon where you go to the movie, you see the audience of the movie theater, and they're looking at the screen, and everybody looks absolutely horrified, and one person is smiling. <laughs> Because something has happened to consciousness which makes what was night day and what was day night, which makes what was fire water and what was water fire. And that's a very profound shift and it's a shift you all are here because you are appreciating it in yourselves but yet you don't know quite what to do about it. Neither do I. I want to reassure you. And in fact, um, in most of these lectures, since there are enough of you new that I can repeat things, at most of these lectures I introduce myself as Ram Das, which means servant of God, which is a devotional path through to freedom through service, basically, and love. And then I say, but I also use Ram as an acronym I mean, I've got Ram Das or Ram Das, which is computer. I'm in the computer section in that bookstore. <laughs> Ram Das, Ram Das, Ram Das. And to my father, I was Ram Dumb. But I like Ram as an acronym for rent a mouth. (laughs) Rent a mouth. Because basically, you have rented my mouth to say to you something. And when I think about what the something is, I think, whatever it is, you want me to say to you things that it turns out you already know. And the way I know that is because if I say to you something that is some far out gem of wisdom I feel I have now gotten the essence of that I want to share with you, and I say it to you, and I look around and people are going like this. (laughs) Now how do you know that? And if you already knew it, what do you need me to tell you about it for? I mean, is this a sort of like the appendix, kind of an anachronism left over from some other time? What I see is that what we need to do, what we seem to do, want to do, and that includes me, is to get together to hear it over and over again, to share our understanding so it deepens our faith in what's actually happening to us. Because a lot of the times when we're experiencing changes in our being, the language that we try to fit it into is the cultural language that doesn't stretch quite that way. It doesn't stretch quite that way. So we come together to say to each other the old stories, to say over and over again what we know to be true, understanding that the first truth we know is that truth is a lie, or that there are, that reality is relative. I'll tell you, I've been, um, since 1961 when I first took mushrooms, um, under the kind guidance of Tim Leary. Um, I have been, um, my whole life has been turned around and I have been pursuing 
some path, it appears like a path, I experience it as a path, of transformation of consciousness, of awareness, of something, of who I am. Because I saw in that first experience, I wasn't who I thought I was. I wasn't who everybody else thought I was. I wasn't who everybody else, I wasn't even one of the people everybody else thought they were. See, because when I was born, I, like you, went into somebody training. See, you were trained to become somebody. So you have a name, you have an identity. Oh, Doris, she's the one who. You get to develop a role. You go into somebody training, and I you go into somebody training because you are surrounded by trainers, all of whom think they are somebody. Your parents definitely thought they were real. <laughs> Didn't they? Mine did. For the most part, they thought they were real. And they trained me to think I was real. And I was galumphing along being real until the mushrooms. And at the moment of the mushrooms, I saw that I was only relatively real. That who I thought I was was only relatively real, and who I turned out to be was much more interesting than who I had thought I was. Which was an incredible surprise, since I thought I was going to spend my life being who I thought I was. <laughs> Is this too weird? Or <laughs> you hear where I'm playing with? See? <laughs> So once I saw that I wasn't who I thought I was, and who I was was much better, but I couldn't stay there. I kept coming back into who I thought I was. So I started to look around for how to get into who I really am and stay here. That turned out to be the game. I knew how to get high by all kinds of means. But I didn't know how not to come down. And come down meant come back into my acculturation. Come back into my acculturated mind. Come back into my conceptual map of reality that was a set of, who knows, electrical, chemical, whatever, habits of thought or whatever, which I will call my ego, for want of a better term. So I would um, override my ego through spiritual practices, and I would go into a plane of awareness where I was still a separate entity, but I was somehow, it was like coming up out of the smog before the Santa Ana winds. You know, it's like you go into a plane and you go up and suddenly there's sun again. You'd forgotten. And uh, that's what it felt like, coming back into sunlight. And uh, I tried all these methods, and I could get in, but I'd keep coming, drifting back down. No matter how long I tried to stay up there, I would re-enter. I seemed to have karma hanging around that required something, attention, some attention about my incarnation. So at some point in that process, I began to see my predicament was that I was trying to get high rather than trying to become free. And that high had a polarity in it of low, and that by holding on to the high, I was in effect pushing away the low. That is, I was pushing away the psychophysical identity that I was born into and that I had thought I was all that time. It's as if once I escaped from the prison cell of my own mind, I didn't want to go back into the cell at all, and I got an aversion to that cell. But by then, I was such a deep practitioner of Buddhism in which I, was, I could understand that the cause of suffering has to do with the clinging of mind and that the things you cling to are attractions or aversions and the thing I was clinging to was an aversion of me as a human being. I was busy being holy. So at that point I turned my efforts around and I looked at life and realized that I had to embrace my humanity into my being to be free. Is this still, are you with me still, or is it, huh? 
because I can simplify it and make it funnier. <laughs> I think it's pretty funny anyway. But. The first thing I saw when I turned around and looked at life was another of the things that the Buddha had pointed up, but I just saw it without any help from my friends, was the immensity of the suffering. The immensity of the way in which forms were caught in some way that was causing suffering. And I realized that the suffering was so vast because everywhere I looked, I mean, just to not take off your blinders so you see the underclass in this culture. That you don't hide from the incredible suffering that exists among our family while we glump through life, paying it a certain kind of service but closing off because the suffering is unbearable. And so we defend, we protect, we do something. We do something to make it possible that we can live with the evening news. In, in uh, emergency rooms in hospitals, it's like uh, people develop professional warmth. That is, they're emotional in the service of their intellect. They go in and they're being kind to a patient and, oh, hello, dear, how are you? And it seems real. But in a way, they armor their hearts because the amount of suffering that they are surrounded with, they can't bear. Well, I would say to you that we're in this funny predicament, that the suffering that exists in the universe is immense, and that until you can be with that in some way or other inside your being and be open to it, you have no real freedom because you're busy avoiding something. And your ability to free anybody else is quite limited. And when you see that what you'd like to do is take away suffering, you realize that you've got to become an instrument for the removal of that suffering, and that means you have to be free of suffering. And how can you look at that vastness of children dying and people with illnesses and old people being deserted and, and kids on the street that are frightened and isolated, and how can you look at all that and not close your heart? Because the people in the hospital wards that become professionally warm, unfortunately, it gets so strong that they go home and it hurts their whole life because they can't become unprofessionally warm just at the turn of a martini. And I remembered a funny incident that I was that in India happened in India in 1971. I was uh, with my guru up in the foothills of the Himalayas with a group of people, and I had a Volkswagen microvan, uh, an old van, and we traveled around India in it. And <clears throat> at that time, there was a tremendous, a tremendous, horrible suffering going on in Bangladesh, which was not. Just maybe two, three hundred miles away. And um, people were dying. It was a terrible scene, you may remember. And I wanted to go there and take my van as an ambulance. And I went to my guru, and I was very agitated, and I wanted his blessing to do this. And he didn't have a word to say about whether I should or I shouldn't. And in fact, for other reasons, I didn't. But what he saw was my agitation, and he said to me, Ram Dass, don't you see it's all perfect? And when he said that, it was like an obscenity. How could you hear of children dying and with the same consciousness say it's all perfect? It's taken me years to work with whatever that is. And that's part of this process. 
Because the process is realizing that you and I exist on more than one plane of awareness simultaneously. And that on one plane, suffering stinks. And on another plane, suffering is grace. And the question is, can you balance those two things in your consciousness? Because to the extent you can, you are then capable at looking at suffering and bearing the unbearable. Because who it was that found the unbearable has changed. So you have a choice when you find things unbearable. You can put up blinders so you don't see the things. In other words, deny the reality out there. Or you can change what's in here. And I would say that we are awakening or being forced to awaken or the conditions are ripe for awakening or whatever. And that has to do with recognizing that you exist both as an actor, as a doer, as a body, as a personality, as a storyline. And there is a part of our awareness that is like this absolutely clear, present, ah. Just... What words you would use? Appreciating the form of the universe, appreciating the play of God, standing in awe of the miracle of it all, whatever. I mean, that that wasn't scrunched out in you by the pain of the stuff. Like people say to me, are you happy, Ramdas? And I look, and I usually say, yes, I am happy, because usually I am. And then somebody will say to me, Ram Dass, are you sad? And I look, and I realize, yeah, I am sad. Yeah. Well, how can you be happy and sad? And it's really interesting, because for years I had the model that in order to be happy, I couldn't be sad. And then I see that wisdom is that you are both happy and sad that you don't have to push away some reality in order to get your rush. That you can be with the universe as it is. How could you live in the moment if you're so busy warding off the reality of what is? What is is that you're going to get old and, and broken down and you're going to die. No matter how good your health treatments are. <laughs> now we may have a genetic breakthrough and then you can just be miserable longer. So when I said to that group I could talk about suffering, death, and aging, to me, that was the grace that we were finally ready to bring those things out of the closet and to be with them. To be with them, to become what in Yiddish is called a mensch. It's somebody that can look and, 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 yeah, ah. Uh, that you can accept the fact that your heart is breaking all the time. You know, you say, oh, I br my heart was broken. Well, you notice in most cases it mended. And you went on to love again. What I think the two planes are, for me, which I call, by the way, ego and soul, for want of a better term, and I'm a Buddhist, you've got to realize that. Well, I'm actually a Hindu, Jew, Christian. <laughs> but you and I, let's let's play with these two levels because you and I are meeting here. On one level, you are a woman, a man. You are, you live in a certain place, you have a certain ethnic identity, you have a certain social identity, you have certain roles you fulfill, you're members of certain groups. And that's who you are, and you have come here to the Double Tree, to our temple today, to hang out with me. To come and hear a lecture. And I am a lecturer. 
Now there's another level at which you and I are fellow awareness. You and I are here just appreciating how the universe is, including our own storyline. In other words, we are souls meeting together to enjoy and appreciate and feel concern for and all the dance of incarnation. We are incarnates and we are also non-incarnates. That is, the soul is not exclusively that which is in your body. In fact, it would be more real to say your body was in your soul because your body is actually the karma... I'm actually, how the hell do I know? Your body... <laughs> From where I'm sitting, in this reality that I'm playing in at this moment, your bo and I'll give you the full treatment, I won't even dress it up for the West. Uh, the soul is carrying karma, the soul is the karma carrier, it's like a psychic DNA that's going through because it's still unique, it's still unique in itself, it's separate, it's still separate from, it's called the Jivatman in Hinduism as opposed to the Paramatman, which is the, the one, the God, the of pure awareness. And so this uh, soul is carrying the karma, and it works out that karma through dreaming, through manifesting in these various levels of reality, of which one of them is this one. So your incarnation, your body, is the working out of the karma of your soul. Now, if you were in your soul, you would see your karma being worked out. Like, I look at the spots on my hand. And the veins and all of this, you know, this is a 65-year-old hand. You know, and I hear the Porcelana ad, it says, they call these aging spots, I call them ugly. Imagine that. Look what it did to my hand. And I look at my hand and I say, they call these ugly, I call them aging spots. And, and I say, that's a beautiful hand. I can do that because I'm not so invested in this hand. That's my soul awareness. When I went into training to become somebody like you did, I developed an ego structure. And I lived within that ego structure as people lived in Plato's cave or in Gurdjieff's prison cell. And then at some point I awakened just like you have awakened. You, can't, you don't have to have a big, magnetic, magnificent, traumatic awakening. You can just awaken because the culture is awakening. And you awaken into the fact that there is more than one reality. And you are starting to awaken out of your somebodyness and even your somebody specialness that you went into training after you trained to be somebody. Aren't you all somebody special? <laughs> So here we are, busy being somebody special and comparing ourselves to everybody else on every possible dimension. It's fascinating. You go out in the woods to look at trees. You don't say, that pinion isn't as good as that redwood. You say, ah, a pinion. Ah, a redwood. You see a gnarled tree and you say, look at the beauty of that. You see a straight tree. You say, look at the beauty of that. You come back with humans. You never do that. If... If she were only a little, if he could only, I like them best when they're, I'm disgusted with that. Instead of, look at that, an absolute essence slimy liar. See, what I'm talking about is cultivating and you and I meeting in a place of awareness where for a moment we can lay down our righteousness and just be together. We don't have to sit around judging God for a moment. We could just sit around and appreciate what's going on. Just listen to what's going on. I don't mean appreciate meaning, oh, it's wonderful. Forget that. I mean acknowledge, allow, be with what is happening in the universe. Because every time you armor yourself against any of it, in you, out of you, 
you're dying a little bit. You're being the living dead. You're, you're closing off a certain kind of pran or shakti or energy or freedom or something. Living, living truth. So you and I meet on two levels. You, like if you look at me on one level, you see a, a, uh, somebody dressed in a good looking shirt. Uh, <laughs> I, a 65-year-old, uh, decaying, um, handsome man. <laughs> and then you shift channels once, and you look at me now, and you see a uh, speaker. You see a person who was a druggie. You see my social, psychosocial blub. You see neurosis. You see all of it. And you're looking at me, and you say, there's a neurotic. There's a... And I am, just like you are. I mean, my neuroses are my style. I don't know what yours are for you. <laughs> you need a few neuroses to make life interesting. You just don't have to take them as seriously as we do. My neuroses went from being these huge monsters that would possess me. You know, I'd be galumphing along very holy and clear and light, and along would come one of my neuroses. You know... Like lust. I'd hear myself, I mean, the most hard, I'd hear myself saying, wouldn't you like to come up and see my holy pictures? But then over time, through all these practices, not that I got rid of my neuroses, but they, I changed who I was in relation to them. So the neuroses became like these little schmooze. That, hello, I haven't seen you in weeks. Come in and have tea. And they're like your old friends because you've been so intimately involved with your neuroses, haven't you? Didn't you think they were real and you were real in them and all? And then you awake and you see it's just the neurosis. And now I just think of my neuroses as my style. So you look at me and you see these levels, and then you look once more, just turn the dial once more, and what you see is a fellow soul sitting here, just like you, saying to you, isn't it interesting? Isn't this an interesting trip? How are you enjoying it? And you see yourself as fellow souls who have met to say, well, what's it like being, with the, what's the incarnation like? How are you doing with it? <laughs> Can you hear this? Can you, am I, you know, is this too, 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 I look at some of you going like that, my soul. <laughs> some of you going like that. <laughs> Half of the audience thinks the other is psychotic. It's interesting, <laughs> interesting predicament to find myself in. <laughs> see, I, what I see is that I don't really know a, what happens after death. I mean, I have lots of models. I mean, I've co-authored a book around the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So, I mean, I've got lots of models from many different traditions about what happens after death. But to me, they're all conceptual models. Trying to define or bring back something of something that is not conceptual. That is not something that the thinking mind particularly can embrace. So what I see after death is as a mystery. And then I look at suffering and the thing that any model I have in my mind of justice is offended by the suffering that exists. And then I realize that why that suffering exists is to me still a mystery. And then I ask how I would like to be with a mystery. How do you live with a mystery? How do you live with not knowing? And 
I realized this a lot in in playing with Timothy Leary over the years, and he died, and I did a lot of eulogies, and so I had a chance to really reflect about it. And I realized that one of the ways that he and I delighted with each other in what roles were those of fellow adventurers playing at the edge of the mystery. It's what scientists feel. It's what artists feel. It's what humans often feel in almost everything they do when they're really awakened enough. Because you see that moment by moment life is the edge of the mystery. And your mind is constantly saying, there's no mystery here. I understand it. I'm now doing the dishes. That's what I'm doing. And reducing it through your mind so you've taken all the mystery out of it to make yourself feel safe. But the fun is, if you, there used to be an old radio show called I Love a Mystery. And what I would say is that what I'm finding is that the way in which we approach our death is critical to the experience we have of life. And that if I were approaching my death, which I am, it's not like Bob Dole saying, if I were a senior citizen, <laughs> Poor Bob Dole. <laughs> this is just a very funny image. I mean, I, to all of you that are Dolites, I this is all in fun. But he was asked. He was asked. Um, he was asked. Do you wear uh, briefs or shorts? Because Clinton had been asked that. And um, president and uh, presidential candidate Dole said, "Depends." I live in a um, what could be called a primarily scientific materialist philosophy. Whether we are individually, but the society in which we are, while it calls itself Judeo-Christian or whatever it calls itself, with some Islamic people in it, it basically the shopping malls are the temples. And you walk through them with eyes big as you look at the deities of, of incredible stuff to consume. And our, we have been so well trained as consumers, which is where the way those role identities are. You're a producer and consumer in a materialist world. That you really get off on consuming or anticipating consuming or being afraid of consuming or over consuming or whatever. Consuming is a big deal. And the predicament with scientific materialism is it really has a really hard time with death. Because death, from a true materialist point of view, is, quote, the end. And um, so, and then they're opposed by all these religious traditions in which somebody said, well, I was there and I come back and I'll tell you it's like this. And you have all the blind men and the elephant. All the different blind men, blind, per, blind persons went to see the elephant, and they came back and they were having lunch talking about an elephant, and one said it's very like a snake, because they touched the tusk. And somebody else said it's very like a tree, because they touched the leg. Somebody else like a wall, because they touched the side of the elephant. And that's sort of what religions are. And what they do is promise you a belief in a model of reality afterwards. So what I realized now was that between those two places, when I looked at what had happened to me over these 35 years, I saw that I had a very deep 
I don't know what word. I'll try faith. Not a faith in, but being in faith. About the fact that there was a larger context in which I existed than the one that I could smell, taste, see, hear, touch, or think about. And that I didn't really understand it. And that who I thought I was really couldn't understand it. And for me to understand it, I would have to transform myself into being it. So I live my life every day within this larger context. It's like taking a frame and putting a bigger frame on a painting and more of the painting comes into view. I can out of the corner of my eye see that there is some inherent, like I look at suffering, like if I say to you, have you had a stage in your life when you were suffering, which might be now, or but some other in the past, most of you would go like that. And then I would say to you, well, I'll tell you what I have found, and I'm curious whether you found it too. As much as I hated that suffering, when I look at who I am now, I realize that that suffering was one of the root, root nurturance of my compassion. And I don't want to, I don't want to ever have that suffering again, and I don't want to lay it on anybody else. See, I won't say it's good for you, go suffer because I found it good. But I'll tell you that my suffering has turned out in some bizarre way to be grace, in the sense of making me a, a more aware and compassionate and present human being. So I live with the mystery from, from moment to moment. And what the soul is, is because the soul is sort of an in-between being. It's like a, a step on a ladder that you're going to later throw away. What you do is you can use soul identity, like you are somebody on another plane. Or just like when you dreamt last night, you thought you were somebody else, didn't you? If you entered into your own dream, you probably didn't enter in just as who you are now. You entered in in some other way. And you woke up and you said, that's all a dream. And so is this one. And the question is, knowing it's a dream, that's like lucid dreaming. Knowing it's a dream, can you continue to dream? And that's what the soul does. The soul appreciates that it's a dream. And the ego is in the dream. And if you push away the ego, what I found was if I cultivated that aversion to that dream, I was trapped. I was never going to be free. And to be free meant I had to passionately engage myself in all of this without fear. And at the same moment, and that was the balancing part of consciousness, live in the plane where I understood it was a dream. Leela, play, whatever you want to call it. And then once you have started to stabilize and establish yourself as soul awareness, or your awareness through the identity of your soul, and getting to be a soul is really not a big scary thing because you're still going to be a separate entity. You're still going to be you, who you, you're going to be somebody. It's different, but you're somebody. But then the next stage is between soul and awareness. And it's like the final orgasm with the beloved. It's the final surrender of separateness. And to say to somebody that is busy being somebody in ego, well, what's required in this spiritual journey for you to be free is that you must die. What is required is the surrender of your entire sense of separateness. You don't get many takers. <laughs> They say, just a minute, uh, I'm planning to do it later. <laughs> it's a really nice idea, and I understand it theoretically. Now, just a minute, I have my... I haven't done my living will yet. <laughs> so...
So what the soul is, is an in-between territory. You can hang out and feel safe as a somebody until the pull between that soul and the awareness that embraces it or the, the return to the mother, to the union, to the oneness, to the ah. Oh, becomes so great. And all the poetry of Rumi and Hafiz and Kabir and all of the romantic poets and the, the, the songs in the Bible. I mean, all of those, those yearnings to be with the beloved. That becomes so powerful at that moment. Because what the soul is, is a being that can be with other beings in love. And it's not a relational dance. What are we, ten minutes? Thank you. You all okay? Yeah. I'm a real schlock practitioner, by the way. I, I mean, you know, I eat chicken. I'm not bragging or complaining, I'm just noting. <laughs> it's my karma. It's whatever it is. But in that Dzogchen practice, what it says in effect is allowing for these different... I mean, what I've done is I've taken all the different planes of non-ordinary states of consciousness and all a multitude of planes, the chakras, the seven and the fourteen and the three and the nine and the whatever you got from all the different systems, and I've said, look, what do I need of all this to do my journey? And I realized that I would, I would settle for the three, the ego, the soul, and awareness. And awareness would cover my whole Buddhist commitment, since I knew that was the root, what is. And then on the way there, I would use my dualistic devotional practices of extricating myself from my ego into my soul. And as I came up from my ego into my soul, the release of not being trapped in these very tight identities with role of coming up into just being this awareness, still separate, but just this awareness, aware of my body, aware of my life story, aware of everybody else, just aware. And you and I could meet, and we could experience a quality of love that was not a relational love. It was, I mean, it's relational, but it wasn't a psychodynamic love. It wasn't, do you love me, I love you. It wasn't romantic love. It was a co quality of what might be called conscious love or Christ love or whatever that quality is in which it was safe for us to love one another because the identities weren't made so complicated by I need, I want, I desire, I hope, I fear which is all our ego storyline. So we could meet, are you there as a fellow soul? I'm here. Far out, isn't it? Interesting life, isn't it? I mean, I walk into a room with somebody that's dying of AIDS. Young person, dream shattered, family ostracizing, economic hardship, opportunistic illnesses, suffering, 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 suffering. It is such a powerful symbol, it's almost impossible for anybody in our society to walk in without reacting in some way to the symbolic identity of that person. And I walk in and I work on my consciousness and I keep quieting down because I have all the reactions everybody else has and I don't push them away but it's like and also and I just keep coming back into this other place where it's a fellow soul just like me and we've taken different incarnations and this one is ending this way and going through this process and I in effect am saying I don't say it I'm just sitting there making my consciousness an environment where if that person would like to come out and play I'm right here I have no moral right to define what that person should do. I don't know what their karmic predicament is. If you were, I, I, you should die the way I think you should die. Nonsense. It's a mystery. Death is a mystery. The process of death. What I offer that person is 
my consciousness is present. Are you here? I'm here. And it's amazing that a person who has been suffering immensely and surrounded by people who were caught in the suffering and therefore were reacting to it, which was reinforcing its reality, suddenly the person was just waiting and comes right out. Yeah, I'm here. You know? Well, what's it like dying of AIDS? Well, I'll tell you, this is a drag and this is interesting and I can transmute this, but this one's got me. And I say, well, I'd suggest you try this, and how about that? And that would be interesting. And we meet right behind this incredibly seductive drama. And to, I'll tell you something, the highest work I do in my life, day by day, is being with dying people. Because it's the place where there's no bullshit needed, you can be right here, they got nothing to lose. And at that moment, people can open like flowers. It is incredible. It is such a gift. It just keeps me right at the edge of my of the mystery. And I would say to you, what I want to do is I want to approach a mystery. Two minutes. I want to approach a mystery with clarity of mind. I want to approach a mystery with a sense of adventure. I want to approach a mystery with an appreciation and love for the mystery and the forms of the universe. And I would like to just be present at that moment, just like I'd like to be present. And the best preparation for the moment of death is this moment. And if you live this moment here, you watch people age and you will see the most fascinating thing. They go from this incredible plan for the future and then when they look at the future, all it's got is chronic pain, pills, doctors, and death. And then suddenly they leap into the past and they say, do you remember that wonderful time we had? And, and pretty soon they've got pictures and they've got grandchildren. And it's all then. No, grandchildren is now, but stories of the grandchildren is then. And they go right over the present moment which was their salvation. <laughs> it's so bizarre, it was the salvation. To bring the consciousness into this moment is the best preparation for death and to allow that this is the mystery, that this is the mystery, and establish that role of being a listener to the mystery. Play at the edge. Einstein said, if you don't cozy up to mystery, you're missing life. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> So I would say that understanding what you and I are doing on earth, we are here to awaken, to become free beings with heart open, with not caught in mind, in order to be instruments for the relief of the suffering of all of it of which we are a part. So there's nothing personal about it. When I'm with some, with, uh, when I'm with suffering, I don't say it's his suffering or it's her suffering. It is our suffering. If you take it the next level, even beyond that one, it's my suffering. And then don't make it so personal that has too much of a kind of messianic stuff. It's the suffering. And out of the suffering comes the response. If you've got a splinter in your finger, you pull it out with the other finger, and the first finger doesn't say to the second one, thank you because you know you're part of the same thing. And there was nothing personal, it was just the way of things. You and I have the capacity to bring two planes of consciousness to our lives. And you will see how sticky that plane of ego is as you start to pull yourself into soul awareness, not to deny ego, but to delight in it. To delight in aging, to delight in sickness, to delight in death, to turn the whole game around so that fire becomes water and water becomes fire. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas's work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to Ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you. <laughs>